Okay, so once again, the church asks us to consider the end of the world. So we're going to do just that, but a few preliminary notes before we get into it. Uh, first off, teaching the church is clear. There is no such thing as the rapture. There's no such thing as the so-called millennium, a thousand-year visible reign of Christ our Lord. He came to us visibly the first time on Christmas as a baby, and he'll come to us visibly and finally the second time at the end of the world as our judge. That's it. No rapture, no millennium, period. When we profess that when we say the creed. Uh, other point is obviously the end of the world is an exciting and frightening topic. So we need to always keep in mind that God knows everything. He knew from all eternity exactly when he was going to have each one of us live. He knows exactly what he's doing. No matter when he chooses anyone to live, he gives that person all the graces they need to become a saint at that exact time in the history of the world. So we need to remember the most important thing is not in when, when in history we live, but how we die. The most important thing in the world, the very most important thing, is to die in the state of grace. That's what matters, to die in the state of grace. All that by way of introduction. The Council of Trent asked that some of the mysteries of the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass be explained to the faithful on Sundays and feast days. So what we'll do today is look briefly at the mystical significance of one ceremony, that's the movement of the Missal during the Mass. So we'll start briefly by considering the symbolism of the Missal itself. The Missal symbolizes the adoration given to God. Keep in mind what adoration is. Adoration is the free and loving submission of our whole being to Almighty God. It's the means by, we, by which we as believers recognize the sovereign rights that God has over us. Since our liturgy, both the Mass and the Divine Office, is essentially about adoration, it's easy to understand why the Missal, since it's a liturgical book, symbolizes adoration, the loving submission of our whole being to God. Okay. So at the beginning of Mass, the Missal is placed on the Epistal side of the altar. That means that a church that's properly oriented, a church that's actually built so it faces east, that's liturgically east, obviously we recognize that it's not facing east really, but a church that's facing east, that means to be oriented, it's facing the Orient. So in a church that's built so it faces east, the epistle side of the altar is the south side. The south side is symbolic of the Jewish people. At a solemn mass, when the epistle is sung, the priests and the people sit, and the priest covers his head, just as the Jewish man even today covers his head with a prayer shawl. And it symbolized the fact that his mind is veiled to the mysteries of redemption. Although the Jews had the true faith, for the most part, they did not freely and willingly submit themselves to our Lord's preaching. They didn't listen. They sat where they were, as it were, unresponsive. They had the true faith, but then they rejected Christ, and as a consequence, their minds remained veiled. We're reminded of this terrible reality at every Mass during the last Gospel, when we hear the words, impropria venit, and sui eam non receperunt. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. The Jews had the true faith, but they didn't adore Christ. They rejected him. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. And so because of the rejection of Christ, the missile is symbolically taken away from the Jews and moved to the north side of the altar. The gospel is then sung to the north, which is the direction of the Gentiles, scripturally and liturgically. The priest and the people stand for the gospel as a sign of their readiness to act on God's word, and the priest listens and prays with his head uncovered, mystically signifying that the mysteries of the redemption are unveiled to him, and as a consequence, his headship is now fully restored in the new Adam, Christ our Lord, to whom he freely and lovingly submits himself. But then what happens? The missile is taken away from the north. In other words, the missile is symbolically taken away from the Gentiles. Why is that? 
Because as St. Paul warns us in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 3, there will come a time, the time of the great apostasy, when the Gentile peoples who have the true faith will then reject it and turn back to paganism. They will reject that free and loving submission of their entire being to Christ. They will refuse to recognize the sovereign rights that God has over them. So the missile is symbolically taken away from the Gentiles and returned to the south side of the altar, the side of the Jews. Why? Because as St. Paul says in the 11th chapter of his epistle to the Romans, the Jews who have rejected Christ will in the times of the great apostasy and antichrist turn away from their faithless ways and turn to Christ and embrace him. So the movement of the mystical mystically and symbolically summarizes the symmetry of salvation history. The rejection of the truth by the Jews, the acceptance of the truth by the Gentiles. The rejection of the truth by the Gentiles, the acceptance of the truth by the Jews. Okay, now let's take a few minutes and walk back through all that and take a deeper look at several aspects of those different points in salvation history which are symbolized by different placements and movements of the missile. Now, obviously, the first symbolic movement of the missile, when it's taken away from the south side of the altar, the Jewish side, and moved to the north side of the altar, has already transpired historically. For the most part, those of us here are descended from various Gentile peoples. Most of us are probably not Hebrew Catholics. Because of their refusal to freely and lovely submit themselves to our Lord, divine judgment fell upon the Jewish nation in 70 A.D. And there's one point here that we're going to reflect on very briefly because it can help us understand certain aspects of the current crisis we find ourselves in. In order to do that, let's quickly remind ourselves of what a type is. We've talked to this before, but we need to know. A type is a person, a thing, or an action that actually exists. But it's also intended by God to prefigure or foreshadow a future person, thing, or action. Okay? Now, because the temple is a type of the church and the city of Jerusalem is a type of the world, the siege of Jerusalem and destruction of the temple are types of the end of the world. So the one point we'll quickly consider was recorded in the book, The Wars of the Jews, which was written by the Jewish historian Flavius Josephus. He's an eyewitness to the fall and destruction of Jerusalem the temple. While writing of some of the signs and portents sent by God before the destruction fell, and he has a whole list of them, he has one of, of interest that we're for today. He states that, quote, The eastern gate of the inner temple, which was of brass and vastly heavy, and had been with difficulty shut by twenty men, and had bolts fastened very deep into the firm floor, was seen to be opened of its own accord about the sixth hour of the night. Six other nights, midnight, close quote. Okay, so in the middle of the night, this immense door into the interior of the temple, the door is so heavy that it took 20 men to push it open or push it closed. It somehow just unbolts itself and swings itself open. Okay, back to Josephus. This appeared to the common men to be a very happy prodigy, as if God did thereby open to them the gate of happiness. But the men of learning understood it, that the security of their holy house was dissolved of its own accord. The gate was open for the advantage of their enemies. And they publicly declared that this signal foreshadowed the desolation that was coming upon them. Close quote. In other words, what we see here is a mystical dissolving of boundaries by divine intervention, a mystical removal of barriers to the enemy, a loss of integrity of the temple structure. And all this is a sign and portent of the upcoming destruction and desolation, a portent of the just judgments of God which are falling on their Jewish people for their rejection of Christ our Lord. Now I see this as foreshadowing what is going on, what has been going on, spiritually speaking, within the Catholic Church for the last number of decades, certainly since the Council. This ongoing dissolving of boundaries, this mystical removal a barriers to the enemy, a portent of the just judgments of God which are falling on the Catholic people for their rejection of Christ. My opinion is that as the chaos and corruption accelerates, the only traditional things that will remain standing, so to speak, all throughout Holy Mother the Church are going to be those elements which have been positively put in place and guaranteed by God. For example, 
sacraments, which can't pass away. Those elements will remain, but those things which have not positively been put in place and guaranteed by God, for the most part, will continue to be stripped away. We already considered a concrete example of this when we considered the question of canonization. We saw that when considering canonization, there are precisely two elements that are guaranteed by God. There are two infallibly determined facts, and they are infallible. One, that the soul that canonized Satan departed in the state of grace, and two, that he already enjoys the beatific vision. Those two elements are positively guaranteed by God in any degree of canonization. They can't pass away or be corrupted by human action. We saw that in the infallible decree used by the popes when canonizing a saint, there's no question of heroic virtue. In other words, in regards to the elements of a canonization which have not been positively put in place and guaranteed by God, such as the question of heroic virtue, those elements won't necessarily be present. They may be, but not necessarily. So if we approach the strange, disturbing, and sometimes shocking changes in this light, it should keep us from following the lead of so many folks who have already succumbed to despair and scandal and dived overboard. We already talked about this, but if you found yourself on board a ship in a typhoon with the wind howling and 70-foot seas crashing over you, and you suddenly found that up in the wheelhouse they're having a fist fight, you're not going to jump overboard. You're going to keep hanging on. You'd hang on for dear life. No one in their right mind would dive off into 70-foot seas. By the grace of God, we're in the Catholic Church. That means we're already on board the Ark of Salvation. The ship won't sink. It can't sink. So even if we have a bunch of characters doing who knows what in the wheelhouse, we just need to keep some perspective, keep calm, and hold on. It is going to get tougher. Let's not have any illusions. It's going to get tougher. But don't jump overboard. Don't jump overboard. Let's get back to the historical situation. So the Jews had the true faith. But then when the Messiah came, they rejected him and fell away. As a consequence, the gospel, the good news, is preached to the nations. Now, we should spend some time thinking about this, because I don't think sometimes it occurs to people. The situation for all the nations, excepting, of course, the Hebrew nation, the situation for all the nations at the time of the coming Lord is they were all, collectively speaking, involved in some degree of devil worship. We have the word of God on this, Psalm 95.5. All the gods, the Gentiles, are demons. Once we see that, once that reality really starts to sink in, we can see that one of the most amazing miracles in the whole history of the world is the fact that these various pagan tribes from which most of us are descended suddenly became Catholic. Just think about it. It's plain, flat, miraculous. Christianity doesn't just happen. For the most part, all our ancestors, those pagan tribes, were like big motorcycle gangs. They just didn't have Harleys. Think about their conversion. It's totally amazing. To get some idea, to make a mental image of it, just picture a priest walking into a big biker bar on a Saturday night and climbing up on a table and starting to preach. Say, all right, you all, turn off that music and listen up. Is that your wife? Then take your hands off her. You've had enough. Put that beer down. Now, I've been set here by Almighty God to tell you all that you all are going to hell unless you obey the Ten Commandments, repent from what you're doing, and become Catholic. Now, that may seem funny, but it's actually pretty darn close to the reality. Christianity doesn't just happen. Once we have a more realistic grasp of the situation, it's easy to see what a miracle it was that the nations converted and were baptized. It's also pretty easy to see why there's so many missionaries that were martyred. So there's big symmetry in salvation history. First, the Jews who have the one true faith reject it when they meet the Messiah. So they fall away, and then the faith is preached to the nations who embrace it. But then at the end of the world, when the fullness of the Gentiles have come to the church, the nations will suddenly turn away from the one true faith and turn back to the pagan gods and goddesses. They go back to the worship of demons. This massive turning away from the one true faith, this rebellion of Catholics against the true faith is known as the great apostasy. 
the fathers and doctors have explained what this apostasy means. For example, St. Thomas explains this apostasy, this apostasy will be separation from the faith and separation from obedience to the Pope. Pope St. Leo the Great teaches that indeed the great apostasy will mean abandoning the faith and abandoning obedience to the Pope. St. Augustine adds this event must precede the coming of the Antichrist. And St. Augustine adds that not all will abandon the faith, but few will retain it. So the two aspects of the great apostasy are abandoning the faith, So those are the sins of heresy and apostasy. And secondly, abandoning obedience to the Pope, the sins of disobedience and schism. Basically, it's an era in which private judgment rules supreme. And since we're absolutely immersed in this kind of atmosphere, and since these are salvation issues, we'll consider them in more depth at a later date. An immediate result of rejecting Christ and his church, will be the atmosphere of sin and depravity. We can get an insight into the moral climate at the end of the world by considering the moral climate in Jerusalem on the eve of its destruction, since, as we've seen, it's a type of the end of the world. Just read Josephus. It's a nightmare. It's a total nightmare. Of particular interest is a large faction of men wreaking havoc in Jerusalem who, and I quote from Josephus, indulge themselves in feminine wantonness, decked their hair, put on women's garments, put on eye makeup, and imitated not only the ornaments, but also the lusts of women, were guilty of intolerable uncleanness and unlawful pleasures of that sort. And thus they did roll themselves up and down the city, remember the city's a type of the world, as in a house of ill repute, and defiled entirely with their impure actions. Nay, while their faces looked like the faces of women, they killed with their right hands. When their gait was effeminate, they presently attacked men's, and drew their swords from under their finely dyed cloaks and ran everybody through whom they alighted upon. Close quote. It's shades of Sodom and Gomorrah. Given all that prefigures the situation that will occur during the great apostasy, during that time, we should expect to see a very powerful faction of militant, aggressive men of a certain persuasion swishing through the world, filling it with their impurities and murders. But this shouldn't be a surprise. Luke 17, verses 26 to 30, our Lord specifically states that the conditions at the end of the world would mirror both the days of Noah and the days of Sodom and Gomorrah. Well, we all know about Sodom and Gomorrah, but what was the state of things in the days of Noah? The ancient Jewish commentaries known as Midrash give a pretty clear idea. In two places, these ancient commentaries state that, quote, this will be edited, quote, the generation of the flood was not wiped out until they wrote marriage documents for perverse marriages, close quote. The generation of the flood was not wiped out until they wrote marriage documents for perverse marriages. In other words, these days are like the days of Noah and the days of Sodom and Gomorrah. In Luke 21, 24, our Lord gives another sign of the times. And Jerusalem shall be trodden down by the Gentiles till the times of the nations be fulfilled. Some 400 years ago, that great scriptural commentator, according to this Elapide, commented, quote, Jerusalem shall be trodden down by the Gentiles till the times of the nations be fulfilled. That is to say, until the end of the world and of all nations or peoples. The great doctor of the church, the venerable lead, explains that this means that until the plenitude of the Gentiles shall enter into the church of Christ. For when this shall be accomplished, then all Israel shall be saved, as the apostle says, Romans 11.26, which shall be at the end of the world. For Christ has regard to the desolation of Jerusalem. This was foretold by Daniel in chapter 9, verse 27, where it is said, and the desolation shall continue even unto the consummation and to the end. Meaning that Jerusalem, after being razed to the ground and laid desolate by Titus, shall no longer be the capital city of the Jews, but shall belong to the Gentiles, 
after that to the Christians, after that to the Saracens and the Turks, as it is at present. And this state of things shall continue to the end of the world. Now remember, he's writing 400 years ago. This state of things shall continue to the end of the world when Antichrist, the king of Messiah, the Jews, shall fix the seat of his empire at Jerusalem. Close quote, Cornelius de Lapide. Okay, so the point here is that according to our Lord, Jerusalem will be ruled by the Gentiles till the time of Gentiles be fulfilled. In other words, till the great apostasy of the Gentiles, at which point it will pass once more into the hands of the Jews. And all this will take place at the end of the world. And indeed, Jerusalem was trodden by the, down by the Gentiles from the time of its destruction of the temple in 70 AD until 1967, Six-Day War. Now let's just step back for a minute. The Jewish people who had the true faith nevertheless rejected it when they met the Messiah. They explicitly rejected Christ, explicitly, and they continue to do so. And then during the great apostasy, the nations who had the true faith will reject it in the process, explicitly reject Christ. So during the great apostasy, excepting for this tiny remnant of those who hold on to the true faith, that holds on to Christ our Lord, the world will sink into a condition of darkness and sin that is like nothing that has ever gone before. And the overriding note will be an explicit rejection of Christ. Explicit. He's the only way out. And unlike our ancestor, the pagans who worship devils, but didn't know who he was, the neo-pagans worship devils, but they know who he is. So accepting for this tiny remnant that holds on to the true faith, that holds on to Christ our Lord, the whole world, all of mankind, Jew and Gentile alike, will be immersed in an atmosphere that is like nothing that has ever gone before, a satanic atmosphere impregnated with an explicit rejection of Christ. And in the midst of all that sin and chaos, in the midst of that antichrist atmosphere, the man of sin will appear, the Antichrist himself. Let's take a few minutes to review some of what we know about the Antichrist. The commentators state that he will almost certainly be Jewish. It is certain that the Jews will accept him as their Messiah. Our Lord states in John 5.43 that you have rejected me, but another will come in his own name, and him you will not reject. St. John Chrysostom, St. St. Augustine, the Venerable Bede, and the ancient writers teach that another who comes in his own name will be that Antichrist whom the Jews will believe. In his book on the Antichrist, published in 1646, the Dominican commentator Thomas of Avenda states, quote, The fathers and all commentators teach that the Antichrist will truly surpass in diabolical and deadly sorcery all sorcerers whatsoever who came before him. Close quote. He will not be the devil incarnate. Only God can take on another nature. The devil has an angelic nature, so he cannot become incarnate. He can only possess a man. Thomas Volvenda, quote, It is the doctrine of the fathers and the ancient theologians that the Antichrist will act, rule, be governed, and deliberate totally for lust. This should certainly not be understood as if the Antichrist were just like one of our possessed people, who are deprived of their judgment and their liberty in acting rightly or sinning, but rather that he, with an integral mind and free will, will choose to sin or do good. And the devil will be able to fill his soul and mind with all wickedness and depravity so that every kind of vice and the most filthy, disgraceful behaviors might be present. In fact, it is not possible to doubt that the Antichrist lusts towards others is going to be the most abandoned of all. Close quotes. He'll rule the world. The doctor of the church, St. Anselm, comments, quote, the Antichrist shall recruit the upper class to himself by means of riches. Close quote. And Thomas Vivenda states, quote, the works, buildings, structures of the Antichrist shall surpass all marvelous works whatsoever raised up in the world at any time. Close quote. Thomas Movenda. The fathers and all other commentators unanimously teach that after he has established his world rule, Then I, Christ, will affirm to all by means of words and deeds that he himself is the true God, creator of all things, that he alone is the true God, and beside him there is no other. As soon as he has established himself as God, 
The Antichrist will command that victims and offerings be sacrificed to him daily with a new, extraordinary, and most extravagant rite in the temple of Jerusalem, which once more shall be raised up and consecrated. And in the temple in Jerusalem and in all other temples throughout the world, statues which represent the Antichrist as God shall be erected. Close quotes. St. Anselm says, The Antichrist shall subject the multitude to himself by means of terror, because he will rage with maximum savagery against the worshipers of God. This persecution will last three and a half years. Apocalypse 13.5. And power was given to him to act 42 months. 42 months is three and a half years. During this horrific persecution, Enoch and Elijah returned to preach against the Antichrist. Enoch is the great-grandfather of Noah. We're all descended from him. And Elijah is the prophet. The fathers teach they are now living together, hidden somewhere on earth, but they will come back during the reign of Antichrist. Suarez, the Jesuit theologian, states, quote, It is of the faith that neither Enoch nor Elijah have died. Close quote. Both Suarez, as well as that great doctor of the church, St. Robert Bellamy, teach that it is heresy or proximate to heresy to deny that the two witnesses in the apocalypse or Enoch and Elijah. Enoch has a special mission to the Gentiles and Elijah to the Jews. They will both preach and perform miracles, convincing many to reject the Antichrist. In the case of the fallen away Gentiles, turn once more to the Holy Catholic faith, and largely due to the preaching of Elijah, the Jews will finally embrace Christ as their Lord and God. Enoch and Elijah will be killed in Jerusalem and lay in the streets for three days while the forces of evil have this big old party, and then to the horror of the enemies of God, they'll be resurrected and assumed into heaven. Not long after that, there will be a blasphemous parody of our Lord when by demonic power the Antichrist attempts to ascend into heaven. But he'll be knocked out of the air and he'll die. A period of peace follows this. It's my opinion, it's all it is, that this will be the time of the triumph of the Immaculate Heart. After this period of peace, our Lord will come to judge the living and the dead. We'll just touch on a few of the details. St. Thomas says, before the second coming, fire will cleanse the world and every place which was infected by sin. Shades of Sodom and Gomorrah. You can read about that. St. Peter writes about that as well. So fire will cleanse the world and every place that was infected by sin. And this fire will kill all the men who are then alive. St. Thomas teaches that the sinners will be killed in a painful way by the fire, but the just will be killed by it without pain or else with a pain in exact proportion to the faults of which they still need to be cleansed. And the reason for that is purgatory ends on the last day. So the just that would otherwise have gone to purgatory get that purgation in their death. They get that suffering just like that as they're dying. Immediately following that is the resurrection of the dead. They'll be taken to meet our Lord who's coming in glory with his angels. Then the last judgment will take place. And that's it. Okay, so what have we seen? We've seen that the movement of the missile symbolically summarizes the symmetry of salvation history. You start with the rejection of truth by the Jews, the acceptance of truth by the Gentiles, the rejection of truth by the Gentiles, the acceptance of truth by the Jews. So the obvious question is about where are we on that timeline right now? We'll consider a few remarks made by the Apostolic Nuncio. Apostolic Nuncio is the Pope's ambassador to the United States. So it's Archbishop uh, Carlo Maria Vigano. Now, last November, he gave an extraordinary conference at Notre Dame in which, acting as a representative of the Pope, he warned us the topic of persecution and martyrdom should be of vital concern to us living here in the States. And he said, and I quote, in the context of martyrdom and persecution, the law enforcement branches of the state can be relied upon to achieve the desired goal, close quote. So that whole conference is worth serious reflection when you have the Pope's ambassador warning us about martyrdom and persecution. But then two weeks ago, Archbishop Vigano spoke to the American bishops gathered in Baltimore. We'll just read one excerpt from the address. Now keep in mind, this is the Pope's Ambassador speaking to the bishops of our country. Archbishop Vigano, quote, I would like to call your attention to the words the then Cardinal Wojtyla 
for the young people. Why he's saying the then Cardinal, Cardinal Wotia became Blessed John Paul II. So I'd like to call your attention to the words the then Cardinal Wotia is reported to have given in an address during the Eucharistic Congress in 1976 for the bicentennial celebration of the signing of the Declaration of Independence. It seems to be so profoundly prophetic. Cardinal Wotia. We are now standing in the face of the greatest historical confrontation humanity has ever experienced. I do not think that the wide circle of American society or the whole wide circle of the Christian community realize this fully. We are now facing the final confrontation between the church and the anti-church, between the gospel and the anti-gospel, between Christ and the anti-Christ. The confrontation lies within the plans of divine providence. It is therefore in God's plan, and it must be a trial which the church must take up and face courageously. Close quote. The Pope's ambassador delivering a message to our bishops. I would like to call your attention to these words, which seem to be so profoundly prophetic. We are now standing in the face of the greatest historical confrontation humanity has ever experienced. We are now facing the final confrontation between the church and the anti-church, between the gospel and the anti-gospel, between Christ and the anti-Christ. Might be a real good time to search your heart, make absolutely sure that Christ is ruling there. Might be a really good time to be very, very careful about staying in the state of grace. Might be a really good time to stay close to Our Lady. Remember a promise, the soul that recommends himself to her by means of the rosary shall not perish. Might be a really good time to stay prayed up. 